you share that you've trusted in the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Yeah? All right. <laughs> then it gives me great pleasure to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> All right. Good job. What a treat. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 I tell you what, it is exciting when we see folks come to faith in Christ and share their decision to follow Christ with the church family through baptism. And uh, this is just an awesome way to begin the service. Let me invite you to stand as we read a few verses from Psalm 118. And then we're going to sing with all of our heart to the Lord. Psalm 118 verse 19 says this, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we stand in this place, let us remember the amazing work of God, how he demonstrated his love once and for all by sending his son Jesus, and he is the center of our worship today. Let's lift our voices and praise him. One.
it's great to see you this morning. I'm glad you've come to worship. And I know we've got some folks that are away because of fall break and all that, but we're so glad that you're here and glad that you've come to worship the Lord with us today. And if you're a guest of the Highland family, let me especially say thank you to you for coming. We're so grateful that you came to worship Jesus with us today. That's why we're here. And uh, that's what we're here to do is to celebrate that name that is above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus. And it's great to be able to do it with the Highland family, isn't it? Aren't you grateful for that this morning? What a blessing. Well, we want to just uh, take this moment to spend some time before the Lord in prayer. And so if you would, if you feel led to do that, come and kneel here with me around this altar. This altar is open as a place of prayer. And we just want to seek seek the heart of God this morning because we've come to worship him. We're not here for us and we're not here for agendas. We're just here to worship the Lord and to hear from him this morning. And so this altar is open. Let's just gather together, kneel and pray and spend time in the presence of the Lord. If you don't feel led to come and kneel with us, that's fine, but join your heart together right where you are, right there in your seat. If you're joining us by our live stream, we hope you'll take this moment, not not to take a break, but to just enter into the the Lord's presence right where you are, because that's, that's why we're here. So let's just take a moment and pray together. Oh, God of heaven, this morning we humble ourselves before you. And we come to realize that in this moment, you are everything to us. The scripture tells us that you are the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we thank you for your heart that according to your word, you're gentle and you're lowly and you welcome the hurting and the broken and even the sinful to come to you to find healing and salvation and strength and wholeness, oh God. And your word teaches us that you are the lion of the tribe of Judah that you are all powerful, that there is none like you, that you roar with power throughout the earth, that that the fate and, and the future and the affairs of men and nations is in your control. And so we thank you for being all of that and so much more to us today. And Lord, we do come into this moment realizing that we need you. God, we don't just need another meeting where Baptist people get together and trade our ideas about how things ought to go. But God, we just ought to be people broken in your presence who come to seek you and and to hear a word from you and to hear a word from your word. And God, that's what we want to do this morning. God, the wisdom of men is not good enough. We need you. So, oh God, would you please speak to us today? God, we pray this morning for our other campuses and and for the worship and, and the study of your word that's taking place in those places today, and we pray your blessings on them as well. And God, we realize that that throughout the earth in this day, the name of Jesus is being proclaimed. We're part of an of a, a kingdom from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And so we join our hearts together with brothers and sisters all over the world to exalt and magnify the name of Jesus Christ that is above every name. God, we're mindful today that we have brothers and sisters who are suffering and hurting today. God, even as we're going to talk in a few minutes about about a, a champion of our faith who suffered and was persecuted, we have brothers and sisters who are in that place today God, we're mindful especially of the missionaries who've been kidnapped in Haiti. God, we come before your throne to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that you would protect them, that you would return them and restore them. God, while they're there, even in these moments, we pray your blessings on them. Give them courage and strength and comfort. Bless and comfort their families. 
And God, we pray that even there, their captors would so hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that, God, you would do what only you can do and that their captors would begin to come to Christ. God, we pray that you can do that and we pray you would. And we pray, oh God, that that, that their captors would be so transformed by the grace of God that they hear in those missionaries that, God, they would let them go because it's the right thing for a Christian to do now. God, we pray for that. And, God, when we've met you in this place today, I pray that we will so let you change our lives, that we will leave here not the same people who came in, people who are holy and completely devoted to our God and we rejoice this morning and we thank you for hearing our prayer for meeting us in this place in the name of Jesus our Savior amen and amen God bless you guys thank you stand once again as we continue to praise the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. That is what we want to do right now. We want to bless the Lord with our voices, the voices that he has given us. Let's praise him. Bless the Lord.
abundantly more than we ask or think lord you will people said. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you to open your Bible, please, this morning to the book of Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Now, it is no accident that they sang that song about three weeks ago and are doing it again today because about three weeks ago, we were in that passage of scripture in the book of Daniel where God walked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through the fire. This morning, we come to Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to read where he shut the mouths of lions. Somebody said it's almost like BJ knew what you were going to preach. And that's no accident. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for all of the things that you are famous for. God, this morning, as we open your word together, I pray before we leave this moment that we would know you and what you're famous for. Oh God, thank you for that message that we serve a God of exceedingly and a God of abundantly. We rejoice in that. This morning I pray in these moments that the Holy Spirit of God would just be our teacher. God, we have nothing of value to say or add to our lives apart from your ministry among us. So speak, O oh God, through your word that we might hear and we might be changed because of it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel in the lion's den is one of the most beloved and recognizable stories in the Bible. Our text today is the story of Daniel's night with the lions. It's the first thing that comes to mind when we think about this great hero of the faith. Pictures like this sometimes 
fill our mind. It's a famous painting of Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel standing with serenity on his face and his back to the lions. And the lions are there, some of them looking at him, others milling around as if they don't know what to do with this moment. Should not surprise us in the least when an angel of God shows up and stands between a man of God and and an, and an animal like that because he did it even in the Old Testament. You remember that Balaam's donkey ran Balaam's leg into the side of a rock wall because of an angel standing in the narrow path ahead of him with a sword drawn. He could see the angel. Balaam could not. Or maybe we think about a picture more like this. Depending on your maturity level. Maybe that's how you see Daniel in the lion's den But that's what fills our imagination when we think about this hero of the faith. I recently read where someone turned it around and said it really should be called the story of the lions in Daniel's den. But the truth is, listen to this, the truth is that the lions in this story are merely supporting cast. And King Darius, the king of the Medes, who was tricked into throwing Daniel into the lion's den is just supporting cast. Our text this morning in Daniel chapter 6 is really the story of a man and his God. See, it's the story of a man who was wholly devoted to the Lord. More than 70 years before the days described in our text, God had captured the heart of a young man in his teens And that young man resolved, according to Daniel 1.8, to serve the Lord. Now in his 80s or possibly 90s, Daniel is still faithful to his God and and God is still faithful to Daniel. Now that ought to speak to everybody in this room because we're all at different ages and different stages of life and yet we serve a God who's faithful from generation to generation. We serve a God who's faithful for through every stage of our life. When we're teenagers and we're young people, we have a God we can trust when we become young adults and, and, and meeting the date aged adults, dealing with the demands of life. We have a God who's faithful when we're senior adults. We have a God who is faithful and he calls us to be faithful faithful to him. So let's walk through Daniel 6 together this morning and see how God sustained Daniel and how Daniel served God. We won't take time to read all of these verses. We're going to work through them all, but we're going to read a few of them as we go through. So just keep your Bible open and look at this with me. The first thing we need to understand about our relationship to God, how God sustains us and how we serve him, is that God defines the public character of those who serve him. God defines the public character of those who serve him. Daniel chapter 6, our text, picks up where chapter 5 left off. Chapter 5 ended with the rise of Darius the Mede who received the kingdom of Babylon when God's judgment fell on that nation and Belshazzar its king. And in chapter 6, it opens with Darius attempting to solidify and organize his empire. It was a difficult time in the Medo-Persian Empire because corruption was apparently rampant in the kingdom. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that Darius appointed 120 satraps or officers to govern each of the provinces and three commissioners to oversee them to make sure, look at this, that the king might not suffer loss. And so the Bible tells us that Daniel was one of those commissioners who'd been assigned over the satraps, the officers, and he had what verse 3, if you look at verse 3, calls an extraordinary spirit. He had what verse 3 calls an extraordinary spirit. It's not the first time Daniel's been described that way. He was described that way back in chapter 5. But in these next few verses, we learn some things about Men and women who have that kind of extraordinary spirit because they trust God. So let me just touch these for you quickly. We don't have time to lodge with any of them, but let me touch these these things that, that the Bible shows us right here are true when we 
holy, are, are wholly devoted to the Lord, and when we're serving him, and he's sustaining us, right? Number one, write this down. They have staying power. Men and women of extraordinary spirit have staying power. They go the distance. Daniel was almost certainly in his late 80s or early 90s, and yet this extraordinary spirit was true of him at 17 or 18, and it's true of him now in this chapter. Men and women of extraordinary spirit have staying power. But men and women of extraordinary spirit also distinguish themselves. Verse 3 says that Daniel began distinguishing himself. He, he had a good attitude and was effective at the job the king had assigned him. Men and women like that stand out. They stand out. So men and women of extraordinary spirit have staying power. They stand out. Thirdly, they live with integrity. Men and women of extraordinary spirit who serve God with a whole heart live with integrity. Darius the king trusted Daniel, and according to verse 3, if you look at verse 3, he intended to name him prime minister and give him authority over the entire kingdom. But the other commissioners weren't happy about that, and so they started looking for something they could accuse Daniel of because they thought he had to go. We've got to get rid of this Jewish exile who's, exal who's been exalted above all of us. And verse 4 tells us that they looked and looked, but they found nothing. They investigated him, but they found nothing. They found out that Daniel was, according to that verse, faithful. He was faithful. Daniel was a man the king could rely on. They could find no evidence of corruption. Daniel had not wronged the king or the people he had been assigned to serve. He was certainly not perfect, but he was blameless. There was no hidden secret, no crime that needed to be covered up, no shameful behavior he needed to hide. He didn't steal from the king or oppress the people. He didn't cut corners. His life and his work were an open book to the prying eyes even of his enemies. Men and women of extraordinary spirit are also diligent. They are diligent. Daniel was not only honest, but he was careful. That verse says there was no negligence. He did his job with the excellence that the king required. But notice this final thing about men and women who have an extraordinary spirit. They are identified by their relationship to the Lord. They are identified by their relationship to the Lord. Daniel's enemies knew one thing about him. When you read this text, you know that they knew one thing about him. And they tell us about it right here in verse 5. They knew that even though he was loyal to the king, his greatest allegiance, his highest loyalty was to his God. They knew that if it came to choices between a command of the king and a command of his God, Daniel would choose to serve the Lord every time. That's what they knew about him. God was the only real king in Daniel's heart. So let me give you a statement. And if you've got picked up a listening guide on the table on the way in, it'll be right there. Listen to this. We never serve those we work for any better than when we serve God first. We never serve anybody, the people we work for. We never serve the people we work with, the people who work for us. We never serve them any better than when we serve God first. When we get up every morning and we realize that no matter what the day holds, no matter what our job is going to require of us, first, before we're anything else, we're servants of the Most High God and we serve Him. It doesn't matter what we do for a living. We serve Him. He is our God. It's not just true in our work. We're talking about Daniel's work, but that's true in our marriages. It's true in our parenting with our kids. It's true in every part of our life. We never serve better than when we serve him first. 
And so the bottom line is we are called by God as we serve him with a whole heart the way Daniel did to be people who have staying power, who go the distance, who stand out in the crowd. Do you stand out? Some of you go, I'm a preacher, you don't understand. I'm an introvert. I really don't want to stand out. I don't want people noticing me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying the people notice you and know there's something different about your life, something different about who you are because you're serving the Lord faithfully. Do you live with integrity? Are you diligent and, and, and give excellent work to those you serve? Are you identified? Do they know you most as a Christian, as somebody who follows Jesus? But because Daniel's enemies knew his heart belonged to the Lord, they knew, according to verse 5, that they would have to hatch a plan to get rid of him. So they did. And so this is what they decided to do. And, and we read about it beginning in uh, verse 6 down through verse 9. We, we read where they hatched this plan that they would go to King Darius and they would explain to him that there's some strife in the kingdom that maybe he hadn't noticed and, and they need to sort of solidify the worship of the people in the kingdom. So they just, they, they concocted this story and they said to him, we think you need to pass a law. And, and, and the law of the Medes and Persians was that once he made that law, once he signed it into law, it could not be broken, even by the king himself. And so they talked him into signing this law that nobody was allowed to pray to or make a request of any other man or God for 30 days. Here's what they said to Darius. I'm sure it had to have made him uncomfortable. Maybe it didn't. But they said, you get to be God for 30 days. And so Darius signed this despicable law that he'd been tricked into signing. He signs it in the law. And beginning in verse 10, we read Daniel's reaction to this. Begin reading with me in verse 10. The scripture says, Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. So in, in verse 10, he tells us about that. And it says, then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God in clear violation of the law the king has just signed. So let me give you the second big truth you need to hold on to this morning. Not only does God define the public character of his people, but God owns the personal devotion of those who serve him. God not only defines our public character, he defines and he owns our personal and private devotion. Daniel was not just a man of public character, he was a man of personal and private devotion. He not only honored the Lord in ways other people could see, he honored the Lord in places where only God could see. And we learn two things from that truth. First of all, we learn that our devotion shows up in our habits. Our devotion to God shows up in the habits of our lives. Think about how easy it would have been in that moment for Daniel to have rationalized this moment away in his life. He could have said, you know, it's just 30 days. God's not going to abandon me if I don't pray for 30 days. <laughs> Daniel could have said, you know what? I don't have to pray in the upper room today. I can go pray in the basement. Let's be honest. That's what most of us would have done. Or maybe, maybe we could have said, it doesn't matter if the windows are open toward Jerusalem or not. But listen to this. Men and women of personal devotion do not flinch, they do not fluctuate, and they do not hide in the face of trials. Men and women of personal devotion do not flinch, they do not fluctuate, and they do not hide in the face of trials. They are devoted when it's easy and when it's hard. See, some of us 
can be devoted, wholly devoted to God when it's easy, but not so much when it's hard. Daniel had spent a lifetime, listen to this, he'd spent a lifetime developing spiritual rhythms to his life, disciplines that he built into his life that connected him to God, disciplines that the Lord could use to build this extraordinary spirit in him. They were disciplines he could fall back on time and time again when the king couldn't remember his dream and and when the king remembered his dream but didn't know what it meant. And when the handwriting showed up on the wall, these were the spiritual disciplines that gave power and authority to the life of Daniel. who Who everybody knew him to be in public came from who God knew him to be in private. For a long time, he'd been practicing what the psalmist said. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. So listen to this. When the word came that the king had signed the document, Daniel did what he'd been doing for a long time. Do not forget this statement. Spiritual rhythms that sustain us in the crisis do not start in the crisis. If you want to be prepared for the crisis that will come to your life, and they come to all of us, you better be building some of those spiritual rhythms, some of those spiritual disciplines into your life today so that when the crisis comes, you're prepared to face it. Because spiritual rhythms that sustain us in the crisis do not begin in the crisis. And we don't know how long Daniel had been practicing this particular discipline of daily prayer. But we do know it started a long time before the king signed this edict. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how spiritual we can get when there's a crisis? I remember an old story. This is one of those old preacher stories. An old preacher story about about a family, a man and his sons. And they were wicked, godless people in the community, and everybody knew knew that. And one day, the, the old man, the father, got bit by a poisonous snake. And he was at the point of death in the ER. And the boys called the pastor to come in and pray. And the pastor prayed something like this. He said, oh God, thank you for sending this snake to bite this old man. And God, while you're at it, would you send three more snakes to bite each of his sons because none of them have thought about you in a hundred years. Now we know that's just an old story. But the truth is, a lot of us don't think about the Lord. We don't have those spiritual rhythms built into our life. We do not have those practices in our life. But we get very spiritual when the crisis occurs. And we want God to do for us what we demand that he do in that crisis, even though we have not thought about him in so long. Our devotion shows up in our habits. But notice the second thing quickly. Our devotion starts in our heart. Our devotion starts in our heart. You see, Daniel served the king, but his heart belonged to the Lord. Listen to what Philippians chapter 3 said. Paul is talking to the Philippian church, and listen to what he said. He said, now that I have already obtained, or have already become, excuse me, let me start that over. Not now that. Not that I have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul said he wanted to lay hold of the calling that had laid hold on him. You remember that story where Paul gives his life to Christ on the Damascus Road? And from that moment on, Paul saw himself as a captive of the triumphant Christ. He was led in procession by the conquering king of his life. That's what he said. 
Now, I'm not suggesting for one moment that Daniel understood the gospel the way Paul understood it on this side of the cross and the resurrection. But I am suggesting that the same God that laid hold on Paul's life on that Damascus road, somewhere along the way laid hold on Daniel's heart and that God became bigger to him than all the kings of the world. You realize that he had served? other kings. He'd served Nebuchadnezzar. He'd served however many kings came between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. He had served Belshazzar. Now he's serving Darius. He served all the way to, to the reign of Cyrus the Great. And we're not sure exactly how Darius and Cyrus's kingdoms overlap, but Daniel served all of those kings. But God was bigger to him than all of those kings. In that moment, when he heard the king had signed this edict, Daniel was caught between two kings and two kingdoms that demanded his submission. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that Daniel's heart belonged to his God alone. Now, let me give you two statements, and I hope you never forget these two statements. The lives we live and the choices we make should remove any and all doubt about which king and which kingdom owns our heart. Ladies and gentlemen, every single day, we are caught in a tug of war between kings and kingdoms. Sometimes we make the mistake of equating the kingdom of God with some of the kingdoms of the world, but nothing could be further from the truth. We are caught between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world every day. And the, the, the lives we live and the choices we make should remove any and all doubt in anybody's mind about which king and which kingdom owns our heart. But look at his second statement. Our God will never own our devotion until he owns our heart. But once he owns our heart, our devotion will never be in doubt. Our God will never own our devotion until he owns our heart. But once he owns our heart, our devotion will never be in doubt. See, when you come to the place that you turn in faith from everything you've trusted in, and from your sin, and you place your trust in Christ alone for your salvation. In that moment, when that decision is real in your life, the God of heaven, through the, your relationship to his son Jesus, lays claim on your heart. And you don't belong to anybody else, not yourself, not the world. You belong to him from that moment on. You're his. And our behavior, our lives should remove any doubt which king owns our heart. And once we come to that place that the king of kings and lord of lords owns our heart, our devotion, the practices of our devotion will never again be in doubt. So notice what happened. Beginning in verse 12, Daniel's enemies turned him in. They caught him praying and they turned him into Darius. If you read that story down through verse 15, you find that Darius realized he'd been duped. And so he spent the whole day probably with legal advisors trying to find a loophole for why, how he could get away with not throwing Daniel in the lion's den. Because remember, he thought a lot of this young man named Daniel, so much so that he was about to turn the whole kingdom over to him. Daniel had been his chief advisor. And now the law he signed, because he didn't pay attention was going to cost his friend his life. And Daniel's enemies came back late in the day and they said, King, there is no other way. And the king knew they were right. And so he sent for Daniel and with a broken heart, he ordered Daniel to be thrown in the lions. He said, why would the king keep a den of lions around? Same reason that the English people used to keep dens of foxes around because they like to hunt them. And that's why kings, ancient kings, like to hunt lions. So he had Daniel thrown in the lion's den. Beginning in verse 16, then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. 
Listen to what the king said. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you can constantly serve will himself deliver you. He said, he said, the God you constantly serve will himself deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of the nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went to, off to, the, to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fled from him. Do you understand the anguish of heart this king is going through? Then he said, the king arose at dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. And what we're about to find out here is that God is faithful to those who serve him. God is faithful to those who serve him. He defines our public character. He owns our private devotion and he is faithful to those who serve him. There's some things you need to take note of right here. Let me touch these quickly. First of all, God demonstrates his power in the lives of those who trust him. God demonstrates his power in the lives of those who trust him. Look with me, look with me again, beginning in verse 19. It says, Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. And when he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant, servant of the living God. Ha, he did it with a troubled voice. Has, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? <laughs> Walk me through the fire. Shut the mouths of lions. Then Daniel spoke to the king. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me. Inasmuch as I was, I was found innocent before him and also toward you, O king, I've committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. Listen to this. Watch this. And no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. There were no scratches. There were no bite marks. Bless God, there was not even any cat hair. Because God demonstrated his power in the life of a man who trusted him. Daniel trusted God and God delivered him. Isn't that great? I mean, when you think about that, he said he sent his angel. You know, the angel showed up when the boys were in the fiery furnace and we told you who we believe that picture of that angel was. And we believe it was Jesus, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus that was there in the fire with those three Hebrew boys. Now it seems as if that same Savior has shown up in the lion's den. A little girl was in Sunday school one Sunday morning and her teacher said, why was Daniel not afraid in the lion's den? And the little girl said, because the lion of the tribe of Judah was in there with him. Hey, that's, that's pretty good theology right there. I don't care who you are. The writer of Hebrews in verse 11 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. You cannot disconnect Daniel's faith from God's deliverance. The writer of Hebrews doesn't mention Daniel by name in his roll call of faithful heroes. But when his list goes on too long, he says, for time will fail me if I tell. And then in the next verse, his line says this in Hebrews eleven thirty three: 33, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises and shut the mouths of lions. Throughout the Gospels, when Jesus was healing people, he tied his miraculous work to their faith. But what if God had not delivered Daniel? Stay with me just for a minute, right? We're almost through with this series through Daniel, so you can just stay with me for another minute. <laughs> Sometimes he doesn't deliver his people from suffering. Because Hebrews 11 goes on to say in verse 35, and others were tortured 
experienced mockings and scourgings, chains and imprisonment, stone, sewn in two. When we ask that question, we have to ask another question. Is our faith in God or in a particular outcome? When we ask the faith, the question, what if God had not delivered them? We have to ask ourselves the question, is our faith in God or is our faith in a particular outcome? See, back in Daniel chapter 3, we read the story of Daniel's three friends who faced the same choice. And you remember what they said? They said, oh, king, if you throw us in that fiery furnace, we'll go in there because we will not bow to your idol. But what you need to understand is if our, that our God is able to deliver us, but even if not, we will not bow to your idol. Even if not, we will not bow to your idol. So why would God let Daniel, that old faithful servant of the Lord, face the lions then? He's in his 90s. Wasn't it enough that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego proved God's faithfulness in the fire? Remember what happened. That event happened decades before, and God's people were still in captivity. Many of them had died without seeing God's promise fulfilled. Those who were left were certainly wondering if God had abandoned them and forgotten his promise to his people. So one more time, one more time, listen, God demonstrated to them that he can be trusted. God's presence and his faithfulness are bigger than the outcome. Allow me to paraphrase what we said when we preached from chapter 3. Real faith works in the even-if moments of our lives. See, you cannot measure the faithfulness of God by the outcome of your circumstances. If God had chosen not to deliver Daniel, he would have still been with him in the lion's den. If he'd chosen not to deliver him, he would have walked him home to heaven instead of walking him out of the lion's den. Remember this statement from three weeks ago, when you're in the lion's den, only it was the fire three weeks ago. When you're in the lion's den, you can rest in this one truth. The God who is with you will walk you out or he will walk you through. Never forget that. God demonstrates his power in keeping his people. But God also executes his justice over his enemies. Beginning in verse 24, we read where, where uh, Darius called the men who had tricked him into throwing Daniel in the lion's den, called them in, threw them in the lion's den, and they didn't even hit the bottom of the den before they were torn to pieces by the hungry lions. But quickly, notice this third thought. God is glorified by the worship of the nations. God, God's purpose is demonstrated in the lives of his people. God executes his justice over his enemies, but God is glorified by the worship of the nations. Listen to what Nebuchadnezzar, what, uh, I'm sorry, what Darius said right here. In verse 25, it said, then he wrote to all the peoples, to all the nations and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that, that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble. In other words, they're to worship before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. For his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen. Our God is sovereign and he rules over the affairs of men and nations Kings and empires and presidents rise and fall because he allows it to happen. In verses 25 and 26, Darius wrote to all those who were under his command. The Medo-Persian empire he's writing to was the largest empire in history to that point. Right then, the three great sites of human civilization are under the command of the Medo-Persian empire. It was an enormous empire, and they're the first empire to establish regular routes of communication. Don't think that's a mistake. Because Darius was organizing it when chapter 6 began, and when chapter 6 ends, he's organized a vehicle through which the name of God can be known to the ends of the earth. God glorified himself in the life of Daniel, and he was worshipped by the nations. God allowed Daniel to face the lion's den 
For the same reasons, he let his son face the cross. You realize that? Because by letting his son go to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, by letting him step into our place and die as our substitute for our sin, and then rise again by the power of God. God demonstrates his power in the lives of his people. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the message of the gospel, that it is the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead that changes our lives. And in Jesus' death and his resurrection is exactly how the enemies of God will, judgment on the enemies of God will be executed. You remember what the Bible says about the, the death and resurrection of Jesus in the book of Colossians? It says in that book that when Jesus rose from the dead, listen to me, he triumphed openly over the enemies of God. He triumphed openly over Satan and the forces of hell. And literally the Bible says he embarrassed them. He humiliated them. He paraded them down Main Street and humiliated them through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. That's the God we serve. And at the end of the day, we've read the end of the book. And just like we have read where the enemies of Daniel wound up, we know where the enemies of God will wind up. And God, through the death and resurrection of his son, will make his name known to the nations. But this Savior who died for us and was raised again, will one day be worshiped by people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And God has given the church as we carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, the opportunity to be a part of what God is doing in his world. Oh God, make us people who understand that we are part of the global mission of the gospel that he put in place from before the foundation of the world, that at the end of time, there would be this great multitude from all over the world who'd worship the name of Jesus. Because that's who we are. A man and his God, holy and devoted. And God sustained Daniel, and Daniel served the Lord. Would you bow with me, please? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. I know we're, I know we're late this morning, but I'm going to ask you to be real quiet and real still right where you are just for a minute. Listen, because the truth is that there may be somebody in this room today who does not know Christ as Lord and Savior. And your movement in this moment could stand in their way. In the quiet stillness of this moment, would you answer the question? Have you given your life to Christ Jesus, the Savior who died? In your place, the one whose name will be worshiped by the nations. And you can reject him now if you want to, but the truth is you will one day bow before him and you will acknowledge his lordship whether you want to or not. That is not, that is not an option. He's making his name known among the nations. You know this Savior personally. He died for you. The God who had no choice but to execute justice because he's a just and holy God also loved you enough that the way that justice was executed is through the death of his son, Jesus. He loved you that much. Will you surrender your life to him today? Will you say yes to him? Right where you are right now, call on the name of the Lord and ask him to save you. The words are not silver bullets, they're not magic. They're just an expression of our heart. Say something like this to him. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I know you died on the cross for my sin. And I know you are the only way of salvation. So right now I place my faith and trust in you and I ask you to forgive me of my sin and change me, oh God. Would you cry out to him in these moments and say that to him and ask him to save you in faith? And if you're a follower of Jesus right here, right now, would you answer this question? Am I wholly devoted to the Lord? 
Or am I more devoted to other things? Are you wholly devoted to him? Can it be said of you that was said of Daniel that they stand out because of how hard their heart follows after me? Oh, please today make sure when you leave here you're wholly following the Lord. Dr. Rod and Brother Chris are going to come and they're going to be standing here at this altar. And they'd love to talk to you if you'd like to come and talk to them about that decision to follow Christ or that decision to, to serve the Lord wholly and completely. Maybe you're not doing now. They'd love to pray with you. Have that conversation. Please let them do that this morning. Just stand from where you're sitting and come and shake their hand. Just whisper it in their ears. This is what I want to talk about. Others of you this morning, you just need to come and turn this altar into a place of prayer. Because for some of you right now, you're in a lion's den. You're feeling the breath of the lions and you just need to trust the Father. You just need to lay yourself at his feet. Others of you just need to come and say, God, I wanna, I wanna serve you wholly. I'm gonna ask you to stand quietly and reverently to your feet right where you are. And these men are here to pray with you. And BJ's just gonna to begin to sing for just a moment. We're, we just wanna give you a moment to process this and to do what God's called you to do. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now. 